Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to, welcome, like to welcome you to the webinar this morning. My name is Ted Harris, and I'm with the Pennsylvania Petroleum Association. The PPA is one of the association partners who co-host the, the Eastern Energy Expo. So on behalf of all of our partners, we'd like to welcome you to EEE On Demand 2020. Uh, this event will be taking place the entire month of August. This includes business webinars like the one today. Uh, they will be taking place each business day at 10 a.m. throughout the month. Uh, there's also various live technical, technical trainings happening throughout the month, in addition to pre-recorded webinars as well. You can find all this information by visiting the, the Eastern Energy Expo on-demand platform to view a complete schedule and see all the different events that are taking place. Uh, to get to that platform, you can go to the Eastern Energy Expo website, which is www.easternenergyexpo.com. <clears throat> um, in addition to the schedule throughout the month, I also encourage you as an attendee to check out the, the on-demand platform to view the 120 plus exhibitors who committed to our virtual trade show. Uh, not only our exhibitors, but our sponsors are really the, the reason why we're able to do this event and make this event happen. So I strongly encourage you and ask you to support um, all those exhibitors and sponsors. Um, our virtual trade show floor, you can connect with exhibitors, you can view new products. Uh, a lot of the exhibitors have different show specials that you can um, apply for or claim. So again, please, please check that out. Uh, that will be available the entire month. Uh, and you can look at that at your convenience. <clears throat> Before we get started today, I would like to encourage everyone on the webinar to ask questions. As an attendee, you're going to be muted throughout the webinar, uh, but you can ask questions by using the go to feed, the go to question, excuse me, the question feature and go to webinar. Um, if you type your question, I will moderate that to Joshua at the end of the presentation, uh, whether it's you know now or during the event. Or when we get to the end, please please ask questions. It makes the, the presentation much more interactive uh, and I think beneficial for everyone. So take advantage of that and keep that in mind. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce our presenter. Joshua Wolf is with Cetane Associates. Joshua has worked with Steve Abadi and Cetane for over seven years. Uh, in his fir former role, he was a commercial investment banker based out of Houston. He now resides in Maryland. Um, Joshua will be Joshua will be presenting Valuing a Home Comfort Business today, and at this point, I would like to pass it off to him. Thank you, Ted. Uh, okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, as Ted mentioned, I work with CTN Associates. We are a financial advisory firm. Uh, uh, almost everybody knows who Steve Abadi is. We basically advise folks in the home comfort space in selling their companies, buying companies, valuation and transition planning. Uh, we were very active. I, I say this because I think it really speaks to this presentation as far as uh, knowing how to value companies in this space. Uh, if you ask me how to value a software company or a biotech company, I have no idea. But if you talk about a heating oil company, a propane company, uh, that's what we know. Uh, just so you can put some faces uh, you know, with the rest of our team, and you'll see me over there grinning uh, because they were making silly remarks to me when they took a picture. Okay, uh, just uh, sample transactions uh, we have done and just really over the last year, you'll recognize a lot of these names. Uh, so we are pretty well known. Okay, so this presentation is about valuing businesses. So the question is why, why would you want to value a business? And 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 there may, it, it basically to answer questions, um, you know, a whole variety of questions you might have. Um, I, I provide some samples here, but it could be anywhere to, hey, I'm getting ready to sell my business, what's it worth, to uh, I'm gonna be gifting to three of my family members over the next 10 years, uh, what, what's the value of those shares that are you know, being, being uh, given out uh, over time uh, for tax purposes. and uh, it may very well be that, hey, I want to know what the value of my business is today because I want to know how to increase that value. So it can answer a whole bunch of different questions along the way. Uh, there, there are also multiple reasons why people will do a business valuation. I, I present here the most common uh, reasons that we run across. Um, 
basically the purchases and sales is the big thing. Um, but there are other reasons for doing it. Um, you know, owner disputes and marital dissolutions, I, I, I'll profess, um, you know, we, we prefer to stay away from those because they can be a little contentious. But, but somebody needs to walk in and, and generally both parties are going to have their own valuation firm. Okay, so the big question is when you're valuing a company, what is it you're doing? Okay, what are you valuing? So a company is a collection of assets. And you may want to know what the value of the collection of assets are, what the value of the owner's equity, or something even less than that. So here we, we use asset value as a starting point. We're valuing basically the enterprise value of the company. And it, it's basically two things that are put together, personal property and real property. Um, sometimes there's real estate, sometimes there's not. That's real property. But for the most part, a lot of the value in the transaction is going to come from personal property, which are all the tangible assets and the intangible assets uh, of the company. Once we value the assets, the collection of assets, uh, we need we we, we're, we want to get to 100% equity value if that's what the mandate for that valuation is. Tell me what what it's worth to me, not just what the assets are worth. So basically, you're going to subtract uh, or or add the networking capital adjustments, and then you're going to subtract all the liabilities of the business. And what you're left with is, in theory, uh, what what the value, your equity value of your company is to you. Okay, so I, you, you decide to sell 20% of your business to somebody, uh, maybe it's a partner, maybe it's a private equity firm, what's the value of that 100% equity interest? So if you just multiply 20% times the asset value, you would think, well, that's what it's worth. But in fact, it's not. It's actually worth a lot less. Uh, once once we get below a controlling interest in a firm, well, first off, any interest in, in a smaller company, uh, you know, private company, is going to receive some sort of discount because it's, it's hard to market. Um, there's going to be a limited number of potential buyers and may take you quite some time to sell it. It's, it's not like going to, the, you know, call, you know, go, logging in to um, E-Trade or to Vanguard and, and you know, clicking a few buttons and, and boom, you've sold your equity interest. Uh, it's just not that way. So, you know, selling a business could take four to four to nine months. It's, it's fraught with transaction risk. Uh, you, you have to pay transaction advisors, uh, accountants, attorneys. So that's that what's kind of accounted for in that discount lack of marketability. So that's if you were selling the full company. But what happens if you're selling less than the full company? Well, once you get beyond an interest in, and that interest can no longer control the company, make the strategic and the tactical decisions about how the company is operated or even if the company can be sold, that interest has a lot less value. So we're going to apply a discount for lack of control. Uh, so I think those are two key things that folks kind of need to realize when they're you know, thinking about you know, gifting or selling off an interest in their company. Uh, the, the, the sum of the parts, uh, it, it's funny, you know, the sum of the parts should equal 100%, but a controlling interest should get more value. Okay, another concept uh, I, I want to um, teach everybody about is the standard of value. Uh, when you pick up a valuation report, there are a number of things that are going to be stated up front, and one of them is standard of value. What did the valuation analyst use uh, to, you know, what kind of per methods and approaches did that valuation take place under? And there are a number of different kinds. The most common is fair market value. Um, it's, it's, I would almost say, you know, eight, eight or nine times out of ten, it's going to be fair market value. But there are other definite, you know, there are types of value. Investment value, um, that's the value, let's say you're acquiring a company, that's the value of that acquisition to you, not to the marketplace, but to you, because you may have strategic reasons, you may have particular synergies, and you may value that business very differently than one of your competitors. Uh, intrinsic value is basically when a securities analyst looks at a company and says, well, I know this is where the stock is trading, but this is where I really think long-term the value is. Uh, very different concept from fair market value. 
fair value is, def is, is a term that's very much defined by uh, state to state, by uh, court. Um, uh, well, actually, it's a lot of times it, in, it's legislated as to what fair value means. And it's basically something that's used in the court system. Um, and you have different definitions in different states. Um, that really comes into play for marital dissolutions, um, minority interest uh, oppression cases, anywhere where it ends up in court. It can be very different than fair market value also. And then there's liquidation value. If a company's approach is highly distressed and you, you want to come to the decision, do, do we try to sell the business or do we liquidate it? You, you, you come up with a value of basically what can I sell these assets piecemeal versus what I come up with for fair market value. And, and it actually may turn out that it's, it's not worth enough to market uh, and then you'll liquidate it. Uh, we don't see that very often. Uh, it has to be really far down the distressed um, pathway uh, to get to that point. And uh, as I mentioned, fair market value is the most common. Okay, so I kept saying fair market value. So what does that mean? All right, it, it means that you're going to value the company as if both parties are, are entering into this transaction willingly, that the, the assets, the business will keep going on as it already is. Um, the, the seller's not being compelled to sell quickly you know he's not he's not financially distressed he doesn't he doesn't have a health issue that is compelling him to sell quickly um, basically you have to also assume that these assets have been shown to enough folks over a period a long enough period that the marketplace is aware okay generally one person or one uh, one potential buyer is not widely marketed but um, you know, if, you, if there are 50 folks that know about it with capacity to buy, now you got a market. Um, it, it assumes cash transaction. Um, you know, so if we, we don't assume that the, the structure of the transaction is anything other than cash when we're valuing it. But if we're talking to you about selling your business, there may be two separate values. Uh, you may be able to get kind of a higher price, but maybe because it's partial, just a partial cash structure. Um, that's a discussion for another day. And it is also assumes the person buying it can run the business, that they have the ability to run your, the business fairly closely to how you would run it. And that both of you guys on each side of the transaction would have knowledge of, of what's important, um, that one party doesn't know something the other party doesn't know. Um, so if the seller knows he's about to lose 20% of his gallons because he has uh, customer concentration but doesn't communicate that to the buyer and the buyer doesn't know it, well, that's not really a fair market value um, either because they both don't have knowledge of the relevant facts. Okay, um, so there are a number of valuation and approaches and methods and there are really only two good ones that we will use um, for when we value. Uh, I'm looking looking over this. Capitalized economic income method, that's mostly for real estate. Guideline publicly traded companies. If to, to look at traded companies and make some sort of conclusion, uh, it doesn't really work for the space. There's only, you know, uh, uh, Stargast and Suburban propane out there traded now, and that's not enough to to you know, arrive at any conclusions, so we really don't look at publicly traded uh, companies. Um, the guideline transaction method is the one that you know sings to us because we have this library of transactions we've done, and we're always doing transactions. So uh, that's actually our, our, the one that makes sense for us, and we're probably pretty accurate compared to maybe a generalist that that doesn't doesn't have uh, access to that information. Okay. Um, I'm just going to quickly see the first, the first uh, method I presented was the discounted future economic method. It's just basically discounting the cash flow of the business, your projected cash flow, and you're discounting it at some sort of rate. So it's difficult to forecast what your business is going to do. Uh, I think COVID is a good example. You 
can't really anticipate that. And also, you know, what are you discounting at? Who, who's discount rate? So it's it's probably a, 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 it's a theoretically very correct approach, but we only use it if we don't have the comps. So if you, you were to ask me to go uh, value uh, another company uh, in another industry, I might have to use way more heavily on this. Um, this is, as I mentioned, this is really uh, what we hang our hat on. And specifically, we look at multiples. Uh, price to adjusted EBITDA is the multiple we focus in on, and, and frankly, also what buyers uh, focus in on. And uh, it is hard to find that information publicly. Uh, if you go to a cocktail party and you're talking to somebody that sold their company, um, you, 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 you might get one, one number and go across the room and talk to the guy that bought his company and get a different multiple uh, because the buyer and seller have different multiples. The, the buyer is looking at what he thinks uh, the cash flow, the adjusted cash flow should be, and the seller is thinking differently. So it's hard to collect that, um, but you know, I mentioned we do have that. Um, so it's, it's interesting and will make an interesting study over time. Um, I mentioned adjusted EBITDA. Uh, you know, all that is is if you take your earnings and you add back interest, taxes, depreciation, and your amortization, uh, it's really a measure of operating income. It's not the best measure. There's no really one good measure. You have you know, there's net income, there's cash flow, and then there's EBITDA. Um, but EBITDA is accepted, and that's the way we go. Um, what it does do is it lets you look at and compare businesses, regardless of their capital structure, whether they have debt on the books or not, whether they're paying a lot of interest expense or not. It, it, it eliminates that so that you can compare one versus another. Um, we then we do take EBITDA and we adjust it because we want to get rid of non-recurring, non-operational related income or expenses. Um, you know, examples would be, um, you know, somebody replaced, and, and we'll go through this, but somebody replaced um, a substantial um, piece of, uh, oh, they did, a, maybe they put in a, installed a new engine in a truck and then they expensed it. And it really isn't an expense, it's really a capital expense. And so we'll add that back. Um, one of the all, all anything related to the owners, as if they're not going with the business, uh, that'll have to be adjusted. Um, anything that a new owner is not going to incur, we got to get it out of there. And here we do have uh, a series of um, sample adjustments. It's not this list doesn't encompass everything, but it's pretty much the, the major ones. And I will mention, uh, I'm going to stop at this point and, and do mention, uh, please send in questions. And also at the end of the presentation, uh, you, we'll make this presentation available uh, since I'll probably um, shoot through for, you know, just to keep us on, on track. So if any, you know, we can send you a PDF version, just uh, let Tim know. Okay, so um, you've got two components to the formula, you've got EBITDA, you've got your multiple. So how do you, you know, when, when you get offers in to buy a company, um, people present different numbers. Uh, they have different perceptions of what EBITDA is, and they also have perceptions of what the price multiple is. So what, what determines whether a multiple is higher or lower? Um, you know, obviously, uh, if it's a negotiated uh, deal, and that's where somebody comes and knocks on your door, and says, hey, I want to buy your business. And you're like, yeah, I, I want to sell you my business. And you guys strike a deal versus kind of a bid process where you, you, you offer the um, business for sale to multiple potential buyers. Um, you're going to get a higher multiple when you um, run an auction process like that because it, it's basically the price tension. People know other people are out there trying to buy the same business, so they're going to have to offer uh, a higher price. Um, when they're looking at it, they look at you know how this business is going to fold into its own. Um, that's pretty uh, important. 
um, because some folks are going to just uh, wrap it into their existing operations and some folks may run it standalone and they're going to incur higher operating expenses as a result. Um, you know, the cost of capital, um, you know, does, you know, if company A can borrow at 6% from its bank and company B has to pay 8.5%, uh, that's going to get reflected into what they're able to offer. Um, company A is at an advantage, has an advantage. Now, of course, that could be offset because company B might have operating synergies. So there are different uh, up and down levers. Um, they, they also want to know, you know, how sensitive is the customer deck to pricing? Um, is it a diversified business? Is it a diversified customer deck? Um, does it have, you know, bulk storage? How much? What kind? And the fleet. Is it, a, is it a newer fleet or is it an older fleet that's going to incur a lot of maintenance expense going forward? Uh, have they, you know, has the fleet been taken care of? And um, the service department, you know, is it full service? Does everybody have licensing? Uh, you know, is, is, it, is the staffing right size? Um, they also uh, want to know probably a big one for some folks will be you know, extent of potential threats and competitive threats. Natural gas is number one and electricity is number two. And except if you're in New England, uh, in which case this state regulation may be um, and, and push towards, um, you know, carbon neutral economies um, up there, would, that, that's a consideration. Um, but I think that's a very long, long term one. Okay. So how do you impact fair market value? So you know, how can you make it go up is probably the most common question. And um, I'm just going to make a few notes from our transaction here. I mean, first thing is make sure all your record keeping, your financials, make sure that's in order. Because if you're scrambling uh, at some point uh, to sell your business and, and now you, everything's a mess and you're making everybody struggle through the process, um, uh, it's going to scare some folks off. It's going to make due diligence process um, go longer, create stress in the transaction. Just, uh, you know, even if you're not selling your business, it just makes good good business sense to do that. Um, I think you need to be able to demonstrate that you've grown your EBITDA over time. Um, how you do that, um, I mean, I, I won't go too, too far into that. I think a lot of that's obvious. You can uh, go ahead and... Uh, you can increase your gross profit through gallons or margin improvement, or you can reduce your operating expenses or some combination thereof. Um, so just, you know, that's fairly obvious, but you, you really do go th need to go through the exercise to understand what your fixed cost structure is and your variable cost structure is um, just beyond gross margin per gallon. Um, you, you need to know what your cost per gallon is for each component of your profit and loss statement. And also, um, you know, if, if it's time to sell, um, you, you'll, as I mentioned, uh, you want to run a full process, get multiple offers within a brief period of time to kind of ascertain, you know, full of your market value. Um, some special considerations when it comes to valuation, uh, real estate, uh, most times when we value it, uh, we will encourage them to go get a real estate appraiser. We are not real estate appraisers. Um, we can value the business without the real estate by putting in some, you know, assuming some sort of lease payment at market and then adding the value of the real estate from the third party to get your total total for market value of the assets. Working capital, um, there are various adjustments that take place. Uh, we do exclude cash. Uh, from the value because you could just write yourself a check, you know, the day before closing and and take your cash. Um, but and, and people aren't paying for cash. And then uh, customer receivables, you know, if you have any large un un uncollectibles, that's going to have to get uh, written down. Uh, inventory, um, you know, most of the time we run into inventory is not accurate on the balance sheet, so we want to adjust that to market value. Um, especially if you've got a whole bunch of propane tanks sitting in your your tank yard, um, also service parts. Um, especially, you know, you have service parts in your stock rooms and across your uh, service vehicles. Um, it'd be nice if you track your inventory. Um, 
but surprisingly enough, uh, most folks don't track their service inventory very well. Um, deferred service contract revenue. So that's just a fancy way of saying um, if you've got service contracts in place, um, you know, but you haven't performed on all of them, you, you need to make some consideration to the buyer that they're gonna that you've already received that income, but you haven't done the work. So you're gonna have to come to a meeting of the minds there. Uh, and so we're gonna make some sort of assumptions for value of the company, uh, even if there wasn't a sale thing in place. And then uh, I'm gonna stress that if you haven't reported this for the you know, unreported income, it's very hard to um, sell that to potential buyers. It's hard to substantiate cash sales. And we've seen a couple of situations where folks will uh, um, not report certain certain items. And um, I'm just kind of warning folks that you'll lose that part of part of value, that part of the value of your company if it's if it's not reported. Okay, so it can't be substantiated. Um, Okay, so you hire a firm like CTAIN or any valuation firm, and you're gonna get a written document at the end of the process. If this is a full valuation exercise, there are sometimes some briefer, briefer reports or just opinions of value, but um, by and large, it's gonna all contain, you pick up any valuation report done by a competent valuation analyst, you're gonna, you're gonna basically um, have these items um, Within contained within the report, so I don't think I need to go through that. But if you're interested, uh, you can again you can get the PDF version of this. Okay, so at this point, um, going to do a time check, and let's um, let's open up to a few questions before I go. I'm going to run through the second half of the presentation. I'm going to do a fictional valuation exercise using the Buy More Heating Oil and Propane Company. Uh, very exciting. Um, so if, but uh, Ted, do you wanna see if there are any questions? Um, yes, yeah, so again, I wanna remind everyone, you are on mute. You can ask questions through the question feature and go to webinar, please type your question and I will moderate it to Joshua. We did get a few in here. Um, just give me a moment. Just give me the easy ones. <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, from your perspective, impacts from COVID, how is that going to, how is that, what do you see from a 12 month trend on how that's going to impact uh, valuations uh, in the next 12 months? Okay. Well, that's um, a question that's on everybody's mind. I'm not, I'm not sure about the 12 months part because I haven't gotten to the point where I can forecast when COVID is going to be done. Um, I do. I know in. I know valuations in some industries are getting really impacted. Uh, not this industry. Um, you know, heating oil and propane. Uh, you know, for the most part, are pretty uh, recession resistant, and uh, everybody is coming off a good year. And we're seeing. Uh, we've done a number of transactions this year. We've got six or seven that are closing. And uh, we, we don't see any impact either in terms of uh, the prices people are um, paying or the willingness to people, you know, for people to go out and acquire. I think if you don't have a leveraged balance sheet and you have, have access to debt capital right now, debt capital is really cheap. And so buyers are still motivated. Uh, you know, it, it, it hasn't been um, completely easy because due diligence uh, has to be kind of done in a slightly different manner, but but I wouldn't say that this is impacted values or, or the merger and acquisition market at least, and I don't I don't foresee that being impacted by COVID in the next year. It's had to be back down. Okay, um, so kind of a follow up follow up question: What do you consider the most essential items that a business owner should focus on? To to prepare for a sale in the next two years? So the, the most, uh, you know, if, if I had to, uh, um, well, let's go back to this slide here. Uh, you know, I think one of the, uh, you know, I, I, I do go back to get, get your financials in order. If you don't use an outside firm, consider 
doing so to at least get re kind of reviewed financials if you can for a lot, you know, going back two years. Um, get your operational records in order. Um, if you've got propane as part of your mix, get your tanks in order. Um, we, we see a lot of messy tank records and people aren't uh, able to quickly even ascertain you know, how many tanks they have out there were kind and, and um, where they are. Uh, they're, not, they're not keeping those records. So you wanna look at that. Um, I think the second thing you need to focus in on is if you think your business is going to be sold as a standalone operation, maybe because of geography, um, you, and you've got kind of employees that you think can step up, I think you really need to work on developing uh, the um, managerial skills of some of your employees so that they might be able to run the business after you're gone. Um, those are probably the two, two biggies. Um, you know, I would also stop running maybe personal expenses through the business if you can, um, which will make it easier going through due diligence. Um, yeah, those are those are the key things. Um, I would I would you know go ahead and uh, do. Also, if you don't have a website, and there are there are some folks out there that still don't have websites, uh, get a website. Uh, that, those are the three things I would probably um, say. I mean, there could be 10 things and a, and a lot of it is very business specific, what needs to get done. Uh, we, people come to us all the time and, and we will take a look at the business and say, hey, you should probably try this, this and the other. And their answers can be different from company to company. Makes sense, thank you. Two other, two other questions just to address. Uh, is there gonna be a recording of this webinar? Yes, there will be a recording. It will be posted within the, the Eastern Energy Expo One Demand platform um, by tomorrow morning at the latest. So you can access it by, again, accessing the On, on Demand platform. There is another question which I think you're gonna address here in the second part of your, your presentation. So I'm not gonna take away your thunder here. And I'm gonna, um, depending on what you present, I will ask this other question when you wrap up. Okay, great. All right, and folks, don't be bashful. Nobody can see you if you, you want to send in questions. Um, it's actually a pretty, pretty neat little format. All right. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna take a look at this fictional heating oil company. Um, we're gonna call the owner's name Jeff, and this business was established by Jeff's father back in 1967. Um, he Worked at, he began working after college in the business and assumed control and ownership in 2002. So, you know, third generations, third generation family members working in the business, none have an interest in working in the business. Uh, this is very common in what we see. Um, they're basically, the pretty, pretty generic. They deliver fuel oil and propane. Um, they perform residential HVAC services, uh, and they've got a pretty tight delivery area and very, very good uh, customer demographics. Um, if you look at the heating oil, um, it's 95% residential, so not much commercial there. Uh, 27, you know, I'm sorry, 72% on auto, 20% budget. Okay, so pretty solid heating oil business. Uh, Crown paint is also very good. 85% um, residential, 72 auto fill, 10% budget. The non-residential propane is mostly restaurant business um, and a few churches and schools. And um, you look at the residential deck, um, there's a lot of dual fuel customers uh, and 70% um, 70 70 tank control, which is what we like to see. Uh, certain, we noticed a trend in certain states that uh, tank control seems to be going down because more, more folks are being compelled to buy their own, own tanks. Um, service is you know, pretty tight. 70% uh, of the service customers are fuel customers. And they offer two service contracts. Um, they get you know, 30 to 45% of their money from installation work and they use flat rate billing, uh, which they switched to about three years back. Facilities, so they're operating out of one facility. They've got themselves an office building. Um, they've got a garage warehouse building for service guys. And um, two bulk plants, a uh, 
a bulk plan for distillates and a bulk plan for um, propane. So you got a, a, one, a single 30 and we got a couple of tens for the distillates. Uh, so employees, um, yes, pretty tightly staffed. They've got three full-time drivers, a seasonal driver, uh, two service techs, and a full-time propane service tech, but he can help out on the HVAC side if he needs to. And you got a couple of CSRs in the office. The driver pretty much, I mean, I'm sorry, the owner pretty much stays in in the office. Um, he, he he quit driving a few, few years back, so he really doesn't contribute to that. Uh, vehicles, um, we've got four tank wagons, two bobtails, uh, two service vans, and tanks and a truck, and a pickup truck. So um, they've got, I would say, one spear tank wagon and a spear bobtail uh, for the most part, except during the height of the season. Everything's in good order. It's relatively recent, recent below, below average age fleet. Um, competition, not so much, but interesting. Uh, two multi-state guys and five independents and the multi-states came in within the last 10 years uh, by making acquisitions. Uh, the limited, I would say that there's limited ga natural gas penetration uh, because of some top of you know, graphical barriers that make it prohibitively expensive to, to bring in natural gas into the area. Okay, so we take a look at the balance sheet of this company and it's pretty uneventful. The, you know, it's, um, you know, the inventory is comprised of the service parts, probably needs to be marked down a little if it, because some of the service parts are old. You also have uh, yard, yard tanks out there. Um, most of the tanks that the company is going to use are going to be smaller tanks because, as mentioned, there's a lot of dual use. And then if you go to liabilities side, um, you're going to see some customer deposits from budget accounts. And you're going to also see there's... So it's from short-term debt, you know, for seasonal. I mean, this, uh, this is a 1231, um, you know, spotlight. But um, long-term debt was used to finance the construction of the propane bulk plant a few years back, and they've been paying that off. Uh, the trucks are all clean, all clear of any debt. And so basically, uh, to balance all, all out, you're showing, showing book equity of 16,800, which means that um, the, the owner's been making distributions to himself along the way. Okay, so we need to figure out two things. We need to figure out uh, an EBITDA, we need to figure out a multiple. And so we're starting point, let's look at the historical three years of, you know, sales and, uh, you know, your pr profit and loss statement, which uh, basically is your sales less your cost of sales, less your operating expenses. Um, so we're going to assume this is a flow through entity, as it says it's an LLC, so there are no taxes in the profit and loss statement. And here we, we show kind of the gallons, and, and heating oil has been pretty static, uh, so they're, they're not experiencing attrition. Um, these gallons aren't weather adjusted, so that might tell a slightly different story, but propane is uh, definitely a growing story there. Um, so you could see that there's really um, you know, the service service department may be a little you know yeah, they're actually doing pretty well uh, on, based on two service techs, um, but if it depends on how much you're using that third service tech for for HVAC service. Okay. And then we've got all, we laid out all the various accounting and operating expenses that you would ex expect to see uh, in a business like this that we run across. Um, they do provide health benefits and retirement benefits to their employees, their full-time employees. And, um, you know, you're going to make notes if you look at the facility repairs and maintenance, you get a pop-up in 18. So you're going to go ask them about that. Uh, also, information management seemed to be higher than the other two years in 17. So you're mentally making some notes as you go through here uh, and, uh, and you keep going through the list. Um, so we kind of get down to the bottom line and we're looking at uh, total operating expenses. Um, and so we've got an EBITDA right now before adjustments of 1.1 million for a couple of years and then up to 1.4 million in 19. You'll analyze, try to analyze why that happened. Um, 
in, in this case, they were able to increase, their, they, they, they talked to an advisor and the advisor said, hey, um, you, you probably have a little upside in your, your margin that you can play with. And so they increased their margin a little and had no pushback. Um, so you, we need to figure out what we want to adjust here. And basically, if you recall, um, we had a list of potential adjustments. So in this case, uh, Bonmore Heating Oil, Jeff, Jeff has basically, he's going to depart. And we think, you know, a buyer is probably going to try to run this business uh, on its own. So we take out um, owner wages um, and benefits, but only to the extent that um, a replacement manager wouldn't need them. So we're that's what the this adjustment, and I'm gonna actually switch to, whoops, excuse me for one second. Okay. Ah, here we go. Okay, so that's this area. And then so, um, we also know that we're valuing the real estate separately uh, from the business. Uh, so uh, at this point, we don't know what the real estate is you know, valued at, um, but we take kind of a guess as to what market rent is uh, based on other rentals in the area. And we basically subtract that out because um, that's um, so, so that we don't double, double count. Um, Okay, so moving, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there were two other items. Um, so we, in the 18, we noticed that they replaced a roof on a building and that doesn't happen every year. And in fact, that could be a capital expense. So we removed that. Uh, same down here, um, they had actually, um, I, I did make a mistake, they are leasing one of their tr their newer trucks. And uh, I, when I told you it was clean, they do have a capital lease, but they've been putting the lease payments through the P&L uh, we see this very often, uh, but in fact, um, lease payments have to, you know, they, they have a principal component and an interest component, an interest expense component. It neither should be really in the PNL. So we remove that. And we also know that they rebuilt an engine in 2018. So uh, as you can see, um, we took out um, the uh, 39,500, which included the 12,000. Uh, in the lease payment for that year. So now we've come up with 140,000 for you know, adjustment in 17 and 186 in 18, and then 143.6 in 2019. So we're gonna add that back uh, to those EBITDA numbers we came up with. And so now we're looking at uh, these EBITDA numbers, and this is what the buyers tend in this market. They're gonna look at kind of current EBITDA uh, number. They'll look retroactively to make sure uh, to see what's happening that it's not a, that it's not a, a negative decline story uh, because then they'll have to figure out if it's going to continue to decline but here the story is a growth story so um, you know what's what's the multiple here without the real estate and um, without the real estate this has propane in it I'm, I'm you know I'm not gonna anchor myself to any specific number because this is fictional. But I just wanted to demonstrate to you that if we applied varying multiples, if we looked at 19 and if we looked at the three-year average, kind of the, the you know, this gives you a, a basic idea that this business is probably going to, um, without the real estate, be worth uh, anywhere from the high fives to kind of the mid, mid sixes is probably what you're looking at. So what we would do if we were valuing this is we would look for through, through our transactions and they really need to be recent transactions within 24 months. What looks more most you know closely like this company uh, and um, and we can kind of ascertain. It's also we're going to look in the geographic area who's there, who's interested in possibly buying this. Are there going to be 12 parties interested in buying this company or four? Uh, so, that, so I think there is a bit of professional judgment that goes into the valuation process, um, professional judgment and experience, uh, and and so somebody once told me that valuation is more of an art than it is a science. Okay, so we we get this, uh, we arrive at the equity value. So we're just going to look at four and a half times and four and three quarter times. Remember, this is without the real estate. 
Um, so it's not the true, you know, true equity value if the real estate's being sold with the, the company, well, we'd add that back. But in any event, we do need to make uh, adjustments to this asset value number that we came up with, okay? Um, so actually I should be subtracting cash out of it. Um, so my bad, um, but you would um, have to, you know, add the value of your inventory, value of receivables, any prepaid expenses. If you've, if you've paid uh, anything that will be of a benefit to the buyer uh, going forward, you know, they owe, they'll owe you some money at the closing. On the other hand, um, you may, you know, uh, you know, just make, go ahead and, uh, have uh, accounts payable that you need to pay off at closing. You're going to give the buyer an adjustment for the deposits, and you may have accrued expenses that they may have to incur. Um, so, and then you have to pay off all your debt at closing. Um, I will say most most of the transactions uh in this space are done on an asset basis not on a say you know stock sale basis uh, because buyers don't like to incur the potential liability that may still be attached to the uh to the equity so that's why we always think in terms of asset sales uh, so you arrive at you know when you, you make all those adjustments you, you get 100 percent of the equity value in the company if you, if you had the real estate value you would add to that also and that would go toward equity value but just assuming you know that we have there's your equity value what we're going to do is it based on the report you know if you if if it was for different valuation purpose um you know less than 100 percent then we're, we're going to take that equity value a we're going to still adjust it for um you know marketability um but not in this instance, and I'll talk about that. And, and then we're going to, um, if it's a minority interest, we're going to we're going to discount it for lack of control. Um, when we apply a marketability uh, discount, that usually assumes when you've used public company comps, so that your equity value is a public equivalent to a public equity value, and that's why you give it a discount for marketability. But in this case, um, since you've already start you, you, you you're basically rely on uh, comps of small non-publicly traded companies already you really don't need to do that marketability discount in this case okay so i think that leaves us with some time for questions and i would appreciate some uh so ted <clears throat> okay Give me a second, give me a moment here, please. All right, <clears throat> your presentation seems, excuse me. Your presenta presentation seems to focus on the seller's valuation, which seeks to find maximum value for the business. If you flip-flop this, from a buyer's perspective, what are the most, um, you know, what are the top ways to lowball the offer? So in other words, you know, what are the most negotiable, you know, valuation factors out there from a buyer's perspective? Well, um, I mean, the, the obvious one from a buyer's perspective is to try to get a transaction, uh, a, a one-off transaction, um, you know, to, I think the first thing you've got to do as a buyer is have your own house in order. You need to understand um, your your own company. It should be completely financial modeled out, and you should understand what your cost of capital is. Um, when, when you say lowball, the question is, you know, are you paying more for the company than you should be based on your circumstances? You need to be ready to take that company and be able to model out to see if this company makes sense for your business. If you're not if you're not running based on a financial model, you're kind of going in blind. So I th I think I think if you're you're getting ready to make an offer on a company, you need to fully understand what that company is going to do to the value of your company. Um, if it's going to detract from its value, then you don't want to move forward. Um, 
it could be that you could afford to pay more than you're offering because but you just don't understand that uh, because you don't know your you know your cost of capital you don't know what the ret- understand the return on the investment is going to be so that that's probably to me you know that's I think that's the biggest thing as a buyer you need to consider. Okay. Um, next question, and I'm going to kind of a speculative question to a certain degree, but you referenced some of the political pressure happening in New England uh, with, you know, movement to net zero uh, from a policy perspective. How do you see the upcoming election impacting future evaluations within our industry from a heating oil and propane marketer perspective? Okay. Um, well, I think the, the, the immediate impact um, will be if they pursue, if, if you're looking at a Democratic president and controlled Congress, I think, you know, they've certainly haven't been bashful about uh, their intent as far as uh, re- raising um, capital gains tax. And, uh, and, and really, I think that's going to, um, if that specter comes up, I don't think it's going to be a 20 21, 2022 um, issue, but it may hit, you know, your pocket in 2023. I think uh, what that will result in is that there are going to be a a number of people that may be on the fence as far as their, when they're going to sell their business. And this might accelerate that. So we may see an increase, uh, a flurry of activity. Conversely, I think interest rates are really low and buyers are still going to have access to plenty of capital to pursue acquisitions and uh, heating oil continues to, you know, whether it's a Democratic president or Republican president, I think, you know, the the fundamentals, long-term fundamentals for heating oil continue to deteriorate. And that's why, why the business, you know, people go and acquire each other. The industry is trying to become more uh, economically efficient. Uh, so I, I, I think longer term, obviously, there's a lot of carbon neutral ideas uh, on the board. Um, I, I will say intermediate term, once they realize that they actually, we actually have to address the amount of debt that was just un, uh, um, assumed to get through the COVID crisis, uh, some, of, some of those things are going to have to be uh, shelved. Um, and valuations in, you know, for smaller businesses like uh, that fall in our space. Typically, valuations, you know, people aren't looking out beyond five or six years anyway. So I don't think that, you know, if you, you go out 10 years and discount the cash flow, the cash flow is pretty, uh, has pretty minimal value out there. So I think, I think valuations will hold up. So that's where I am. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Next question. Uh, based on your experience, what percentage of businesses are sold with retained earnings as a part of the deal? Okay, oh, that's a good. That's a good question. Um, I mean, for the most part, we're only seeing retained earnings uh, in the structure uh, when when it's called for. Uh, when there's some customer concentration issue uh, or some other issue, you know, uncertainty that um, you know the retained gallon is basically a, is basically an earnout. And it's a, it's a mechanism by which uh, the, the buyer and the seller can share some of the some of the downside risk. So uh, we're not seeing much of that uh, over the past um, 18 months. Uh, very few, uh, very few, and, and it certainly may have had a minimal retained gallon component to address a specific issue. But we're not seeing uh, retained gallon deals right now. I think part of it is because capital is so cheap. Okay. Uh, that is it from a question perspective. Uh, I'll give it 15 seconds here to see if anything else comes in. But okay. in the meantime, uh, I would like to, again, just remind everyone, <clears throat> we will have another business session tomorrow at 10 a.m. And that will continue uh, into next week as well as the, you know, the entire month of August. So please, uh, please check our upcoming schedule to see um, if anything interests you in that regard. Don't have any other questions. So with that being said, Joshua, thank you very much. Appreciate your expertise uh, and your time here today. And thank you to all all the attendees that, that joined us. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. 
Thank you, Ted. Excellent. Take care, everyone.